It got to where it was too much. We were afraid of losing her. Things started to really get out of control. There was nothing else we could say. It, it, either we did it or there was a chance that something bad really can happen. That could have been the end of her life. I was scared to death. We were just helpless uh, until somebody could find out what was really going on. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. Trisha and David Kelb could never have prepared themselves for what happened the day their daughter Taylor was born. Little did they know it would be just the first crisis in a harrowing series of bizarre and life-threatening medical emergencies. I was just doing the best I could. I was just trying to keep her alive. Then, for seven years, Tracy Killarney struggled to understand how a seemingly ordinary headache could turn her life into a living hell. I was pretty sure I was gonna die. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. In December of 1996, young Florida couple Trisha and David Kelb are thrilled to learn that she is pregnant with their first child. When I found out I was pregnant, we were very excited. This was my first child. I was excited. I couldn't wait. For the next nine months, Trisha's pregnancy is uneventful, and the Kelbs anxiously await the birth of what everyone anticipates will be a healthy baby girl. But when Trisha finally goes into labor on June 6th, progress is slower than she expected. After 24 hours of contractions, the baby hasn't been born. I was still only about four centimeters dilated. Then her heart rate started fluctuating. I was scared. Fearful of the baby's declining heart rate, doctors perform an emergency C-section. And Trisha delivers a baby girl she and David name Taylor. But from the very first moment, doctors can see something is very wrong. She wasn't breathing. They just took her. I just saw them take her away. Working quickly, the doctors are able to resuscitate Taylor, who is immediately taken to the pediatric intensive care unit. Eight hours later, she is stable enough for Trisha and David to see her for the first time. When we did see her, it was just like a shock. You want a healthy baby. There was no troubles from the beginning, and now you can't even hold her. It made everybody worry. She just had tubes everywhere, and she was intubated. It was scary. Then, just a few hours later, Taylor turns blue and has to be resuscitated again. These breath-holding spells, known as apnea, are common in infants, but Taylor's are lasting so long that her heart is actually stopping. When she would have the breath-holding spells, then she would lose all of her body functions. She had no control over it. Her body would just completely shut down. Strangely, the episodes seem to happen every time Taylor is touched or physically stimulated in some way. Even a slight brush of the hand can set her off. It's just a constant thing. Every time we touched her or they touched her. But they kind of gave her medication to just stabilize everything. Because they didn't know what was going on. The doctors have never seen anything quite like it. Grasping at straws, they try several different medications to see if they will help. They called in cardiologists. They called in any kind of doctor they could think of to try and figure out what was going on. After four days, the medical team encourages the Kelbs to go home while they continue running tests to figure out exactly what's causing these strange episodes. Trisha and David reluctantly leave Taylor in the hands of the pediatric intensive care staff. When I left the hospital without her, it was bad because, you know, she kept having these episodes and my worst fear was not being there if something happened to her. 
For the Kelbs, life is now completely focused on their critically ill daughter. David is forced to return to work to support the family, while Trisha spends every moment possible at the hospital with Taylor. I just drove back and forth from the hospital all day long, all night long. The first time I held her, it was great. It was so scary, though, because, she, you know, almost every time we would touch her, she would have these episodes. You wanted to hold her, but when you did, you knew something bad was going to happen. The doctors didn't have an idea what was going on. Guessing was just about all they had. They've never seen a child like this. At least 20, 30 doctors have seen her, and they have no idea. We were told there was nothing else they could do. They didn't know what was wrong. After two months of seemingly endless testing, doctors determined that there's nothing more they can do for Taylor at the hospital that the Kelbs can't do at home. They give Trisha detailed instructions on what to do if Taylor stops breathing, and then they discharge the newborn. They gave me a CPR course, they gave me an apnea monitor, and they sent us home. And our biggest thing was, we want her home. We want our baby there, it'll be better, she'll get better. You know, our positive attitude was, we're going forward. But alarmingly, Taylor's episodes don't stop once she gets home. In fact, they appear to get worse. I was just doing the best I could. I was just trying to keep her alive. It was a constant thing. She would just go into these episodes. I had the oxygen at the house, and the monitors would just go off all the time, and I would have to just do CPR. And I would always call rescue every time. It just got worse and worse. I would come home from work, and there's the EMTs again. It got to where it was too much. We were afraid of losing her. From the moment she was born, Trisha and David Kelb's four-month-old daughter, Taylor, has suffered from terrifying breath-holding spells during which her heart stops beating. The doctors have assured the new parents that Taylor's episodes can be managed at home, but the responsibility of keeping her alive is proving to be far more overwhelming than they had ever expected. She was home probably about a week, a week and a half, and I called Children's Hospital. And I said, I can't keep doing this. I, I can't keep doing CPR on my child, and I'm going to bring her down there. <laughs> After reviewing her medical history, the doctors decide that the next step is to admit Taylor to the seizure unit, where they can get a highly detailed look at her brain activity and keep her on 24-hour surveillance. They wanted to monitor her constantly to see if they could figure out what was going on. And they hook her up to all the EEGs, and they video her for days. This time, Taylor stays at the hospital for three months, during which doctors test everything, from her blood levels to her sleeping patterns to her nervous system, hoping to find some kind of answer. But result after result comes back the same, normal. Taylor's condition remains a complete mystery. You expect to go to the doctor and you just expect them to know what's going on and, you know, test after test. And I was just, how can you not know what's wrong with my baby? Taylor, now seven months old, is once again discharged and sent home. I was extremely nervous about taking Taylor home. She was always worried every day, 24-7, if she's going to be better or not. You know, I got to be the one that says, don't worry. Now, both parents must be in a constant state of readiness. Taylor's harrowing episodes continue to occur on a daily basis. For months, the Kelbs are in and out of doctor's offices, desperate for an answer. Still no one is able to help. Taylor became my life. I mean, I, my goal was to keep her alive, and I, I just, I was with her all the time. She had to have somebody with her 24 hours, so I stayed home. Trisha couldn't even go out of the room. She hardly ever got through a shower without her having to come out because she had stopped breathing. The Kelbs continue like this for more than a year, with no answers from the revolving door of medical experts, they live in constant fear that they will lose Taylor. But when she is 18 months old, a new doctor suggests a drastic step that may help. When she would have 
her episodes, her heart rate would slow down. So they figured, I guess, if we can keep the heart rate up, maybe they can stop that mechanism from happening. So the doctors decide to put a pacemaker in Taylor. A pacemaker is a small computer placed in the chest wall just under the skin and attached to the heart by wires. The pacemaker is programmed to ensure that the heart beats a certain number of times per minute. If the heart slows down, an electrical impulse is sent to make it beat faster. I was scared to death. We were like, oh God, if it's for the best, that's what we have to do. And basically there was nothing else we could say. It, it, either we did it or there's a chance that something bad really can happen. While doctors reassure the Kelbs that the pacemaker surgery is absolutely necessary to save Taylor's life, Trisha and David are terrified that she will have an episode while on the operating table. Every minute feels like an eternity to the Kelbs as they anxiously await word on her status. But after 45 minutes, the device is successfully implanted and Taylor is wheeled into recovery. After she had the pacemaker put in, I did notice a change in her. The episodes where she would stop breathing and everything became very scarce. They, they didn't happen all the time. I used to be terrified of being left alone with her. I was afraid the heart would stop and the, and the breathing would stop and I wouldn't be able to get them started. Or, but with the pacemaker, I knew it was going to keep the heart going long enough for me to get somebody there if I had to have somebody there. I and mean, I was just like, oh my gosh, thank goodness, you know, this is great. Because we were able to have somewhat of a normal life. But optimism soon turns to fear when Taylor is four and the family must face a new and very grim issue. She would turn these different colors, like one side of her body would be real, real red. The other side would be normal. The pain will be so severe she literally shakes from head to toe, and she'll just yell, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Since the day she was born, little Taylor Kelb's breathing and heart have stopped almost every day. At only 18 months old, doctors successfully implanted a pacemaker to help control the life-threatening episodes. The Kelbs begin to hope that she'll grow out of her symptoms altogether, but they're crushed when Taylor begins experiencing the most bizarre symptom yet. She would turn these different colors. It would be like a line that will go straight down her body, her tongue, everything. And this side will be just as bright red as can be. And the other side would be normal. The doctors would call them harlequins, which they said goes away. Most terrifying to the Kelbs are the ear-splitting screams Taylor lets out the entire time the episode is happening. She screams for about five, five to 10 minutes. She's like a horror film girl. She can scream at the top of her lungs. From the time that she screams, she turns red almost immediately. And the color lasts about 20 minutes, probably. As the months pass, the Harlequin episodes become a daily part of the Kelb's life. And as Taylor gets older, her episodes evolve, becoming even more violent and scary. She tries to rip my hair out. She tries to pull her hair out. She tries to bite herself, me, rip my clothes off. I mean, it, is, it looks like we're fighting during the episode. She'll bite her lips. She'll bite her, you know, her tongue. My hands, my hands, her hands are on fire. Doctors have always reassured the Kelbs that despite her ear-piercing screams, Taylor is not in any pain during the Harlequin episodes. But Trisha just doesn't buy it. I started really pushing the issue that she was in pain. The doctors at the time were arguing with me. They would say, oh no, she's just crying like a baby. She's fine. You know, she's not in pain. She was probably two and a half years old before they actually believed that this kid was in pain. The Kelbs visit doctors everywhere, from New York to Boston to Texas. But no one can find the cause of Taylor's bizarre episodes. The best doctors are able to do is try to treat the pain by adding yet another medication to the long list she's already on. 24 hours a day, she was taking more medicine than I've ever seen anybody. She was probably having three, four, five episodes a day. 
It was very hard on her body. I mean, she was just, you could tell, it would just wear her out during the episodes. Nothing really seemed to help. The Kelbs go on with their lives the best they can. When Taylor turns four, she begins homeschool under Trisha's watchful eye. During her rare free time, Trisha takes matters into her own hands and relentlessly searches for answers. I was so tired of the doctors not knowing what was wrong with her. I was tired of them just guessing. She was their guinea pig, basically. <laughs> I was tired of it. Despite a series of dead ends, Trisha refuses to give up and keeps looking for clues to her daughter's strange affliction. Over time, the Kelbs grow used to dealing with Taylor's episodes, which eventually taper down to about once a month. And when she turns seven, things seem to be so under control, the Kelbs decide to try sending her to a nearby school. She looks so forward to every, every day going, getting up and putting on her uniform and going to school and being able to go outside and, and um, play with the other kids. But her happiness doesn't last long. After the pacemaker was put in, Taylor's breath-holding episodes had all but disappeared. But once she starts school, the terrifying attacks return with a vengeance. Once she started school, it started happening every two weeks, every week. It started taking a toll on her. But as Taylor's attacks increase in frequency, Trisha begins to notice a very distinct pattern. It seemed like she was just constantly catching something. And whenever she was getting sick, if she would get a cold or anything, she would have the breath-holding episode again. Being around so many other children was most likely making Taylor vulnerable to illness and more episodes. And then it sort of getting got a little crazy to where it took more effort for her mother to let her go to school in worry. She wanted to be there, but she knew that it just wasn't working out. Trisha is devastated to have to take Taylor out of school, but once she begins homeschool again, the frequent attacks drop off. Relieved, Trisha is now more determined than ever to find some clue as to what's causing Taylor's mysterious episodes. If there was an answer, she was gonna find it. She was the one that wouldn't stop. You would say to yourself, there has got to be somebody out there that has had what she has. I mean, if there's got to be. Three more years pass, and shortly after Taylor turns 10, Trisha's research leads her to a local geneticist named Paul Benke. Despite her long history of dashed expectations, she makes an appointment for her daughter. When she came into the office uh, for her first visit, she had an attack of pain, of redness, slow heartbeat, and she would stop breathing. And it was so dramatic because um, she started screaming, pulling at her hair, and crying out that uh, she had burning over her body uh, in pain. And this lasted for several minutes. Never had seen anything quite like that. It was so bizarre. After witnessing her shocking attack, Dr. Benke meticulously examines Taylor. He's perplexed, but determined to help the Kelbs. And he was like, we're helping this child, whatever we gotta do. Let me look into some things and I'll get back with you. Trisha returns home with renewed hope that after 10 long years, they may finally be on the verge of something. She becomes consumed with her research and soon after comes across a website that just may change everything. It was on a Friday and I got online and this disorder popped up and it was almost like I'm reading it and I thought somebody, it was like somebody was playing a joke on me. I'm looking around going, what? This sounds like Taylor. She called me all excited. Mom, I think I found out what it is. I said, well, you gotta be kidding. And then when I got home and I read it, I was like, wow. And it was just amazing. Trisha prints everything she has found and rushes to fax it to Dr. Binky. Dr. Binky said, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you found this, you know? <laughs> I, I just can't believe it. For 10 years, Trisha and David Kelb have been searching for an answer to their daughter's bizarre and frightening condition. She's endured frequent episodes of excruciating all over body pain, and randomly, her breathing and heartbeat have stopped altogether. 
But now they have a glimmer of hope. They've found a possible cause for the condition on the internet and have taken the clues to their new geneticist, Dr. Paul Benke. We don't have all the answers. Usually the good things happen when parents turn attention to the diagnosis. It certainly was the best idea about Taylor that I'd heard. The suspected disorder is so rare that the only place to test for it is a special lab in the Netherlands. So Taylor's blood is drawn and sent off to Europe. The Kelbs must now wait six long weeks for the results, but they are hopeful. When we were waiting, I knew. I mean, I just knew that this is what she had. I just had a feeling. And indeed, when the results finally return, they confirm what Dr. Benke and the Kelbs have suspected. The result of the test was that she had a mutation. It's called paroxysmal extreme pain disorder. Paroxysmal extreme pain disorder, or PEPD, is caused by a genetic mutation in the sodium channels, which play a critical role in transmitting pain signals throughout the body. They are one of the building blocks of the autonomic nervous system that helps regulate movement, sensation, and body temperature. For PEPD sufferers, even the slightest touch at times can aggravate the sodium channels, sending the body into a prolonged state of extreme pain. The sodium channels are all of our pain channels, and so the whole skin is innervated and they affect the skin of her whole body. This accounts for the bouts of extreme pain that Taylor has experienced throughout her life, but the Harlequin episodes are trickier to explain. We do know that half of the body uh, under certain circumstances can be affected by impulses that arise in half of our spine. And the sodium channel is only imparting a message to half of her body because half of her spine is working. The sodium channels also operate within the autonomic nervous system to conduct information about heart rate and respiratory function. Taylor's mutation, however, often interfered with this communication, which explains why her heart and breathing could simply shut down at a moment's notice. Well, the autonomic nervous system takes care of things like heartbeat and breathing while we're awake and while we're sleeping. The Kelbs can hardly believe that after so many years of searching, all the pieces of the puzzle are finally coming together. And they are shocked to find out just how rare PEPD is. Investigators recently put together a few families. They were able to come up with eight families that the investigators knew about, and that's all that they knew about in, in the world. With the diagnosis in hand comes the tricky part, finding a way to relieve Taylor's array of symptoms. Despite having been identified, very little is known about this rare disorder. We haven't completely solved Taylor's problem, but now that we have a, an appreciation that sodium channels are involved, and knowing the mechanism of the attacks is helpful in coming up with forms of therapy and helping Taylor. While there is no one medication that can alleviate all of Taylor's symptoms, Dr. Benke has discovered that medications meant for other conditions, like one in particular that helps with seizures, do seem to give Taylor some relief from the pain. She's gotten much better because she's on her medication full force. Now that Taylor's been diagnosed, I, I'm optimistic. Hopefully as she gets older, the attacks will be less frequent and less severe. Today, after half a year on the medications, 10-year-old Taylor's episodes are diminishing, and hopes for her future are high. She's very happy. I mean, for what she goes through, she'll have a bad episode and just carry on like if nothing ever happened. Taylor is probably the strongest-willed little kid you can ever imagine. That little girl do anything. She's very outgoing, very sympathetic to other children, especially when they get hurt. And I guess it's because she knows what hurt is. For Trisha and David Kelb, their daughter's strange and agonizing symptoms were so rare that none of their doctors had ever seen anything like them before. But for Tracy Killarney, her symptoms were so common that her rare disorder was completely overlooked. In 1994, 33-year-old Tracy Killarney was leading a busy life. She had a happy home, was a devoted mother to her teenage son, and loved her nursing job at the local hospital. I had a lot of energy and I really enjoyed doing what I do and helping patients. She was a very energetic, happy person, always there. She liked to be on the go a lot. But then, one day in the summer of that same year, Tracy is forced to slow down when she begins suffering from excruciating headaches. She always had migraines, but they started getting really bad. Just totally incapacitated her. Even more disturbing, these headaches feel different than any she has ever experienced before. 
My headaches worked backwards towards my neck. I just started getting an ache in the base of the skull. I did have nausea frequently, and it was associated with just, it was too much pain. She would have to be in a dark room over her uh, eyes and damp washcloths, and it'd be all day, and possibly into the next day. Over the next few months, Tracy suffers from these debilitating headaches with alarming frequency. Concerned that something could be really wrong, Tracy makes appointments with multiple doctors, but they all say the same thing. They said that she was fine. The doctors uh, really couldn't find anything wrong with her. Get the standard response of, you know, try these medications. You should stay away from nuts and chocolate. Without a diagnosis, Tracy has no choice but to grit her teeth and endure the headaches, all the while putting on a brave face in front of her family. She didn't want to show weakness in front of me. I learned to cope with pain and just kind of take whatever medications the physician ordered for me and try to buck up and move on. But Tracy finds it more and more difficult to brush aside her discomfort as scary new symptoms begin to develop. I started noticing tingling in my face and numbness just on half of it. You could literally draw a line down the middle of my face and feel tingling on the right side and normal on the left, and a sense of fullness in my ears. Along with the tinglings came the burning sensation in her extremities like arms and, and down her leg. By this point, Tracy has been coping with her excruciating headaches for almost two years. But this alarming new development is enough to send her back to the doctor. They had suggested that maybe I needed an MRI. Tracy anxiously awaits the results, hopeful that they'll reveal the cause of her painful symptoms. Of course, they said it was normal. And I was really frustrated and um, a little bit embarrassed. And I didn't want to go home and tell my family, yeah, I had another test and it came back normal. And, you know, I'm just going to have to buck up and live with it. But over the next year, Tracy's agonizing headaches begin to occur more often. It just got more frequent. Uh, twice a week and three times a week. It was such an ongoing thing that she didn't really want to complain. I was frustrated, I was fed up, I was, you know, tired of them. Sick of being sick, I used to say a lot. She just dealt with the pain. And uh, unless it was a total migraine and, and, and it would just put her out. Tracy struggles to keep going at work and at home. But then, out of the blue, a terrifying new symptom rears its head. She would just have like dizzy spells where she'd almost fall over and have to catch herself. I could bounce back and forth down the hallways and have to hold my arms up to steady myself as I was walking. Um, and if I got up too fast, I would literally bang into furniture and have these big bruises all over my legs. But they were also being accompanied by the headaches and the facial numbness and tingling and the nausea. As a nurse, Tracy knows that balance issues are connected to the inner ear. She now wonders if this could be the reason behind her dizziness. I decided to go off on my own and find an ear, nose, and throat doctor, thinking he might have some new ideas and some fresh perspectives. Tracy is confident that the ear, nose, and throat specialist will find the answer to her problem. But after a series of tests on her aural nerves, she's taken aback by what he has to say. It came back normal. He basically said, you know, a lot of people have dizzy spells, and it's probably more important if you're having them to just learn how to get used to having them. Tracy Killarney has been experiencing debilitating headaches, burning sensations, and dizziness for more than four years. Now she's sure that a visit to an ear, nose, and throat specialist will reveal the cause of her symptoms. But when the results of the tests come back, her hopes are dashed. After I saw the ENT doctor, I think I just resigned myself that it was normal. I needed to just stop complaining. But over the next two years, Tracy experiences a string of mysterious new symptoms. She would go in uh, coughing spasms, and she'd cough for like a minute and a half straight without being able to get a breath of air. It wasn't deep from my lungs. It was just a tickly in the back of the throat cough. 
and my husband and I were discussing what could be causing this word cough, and we were even like vacuuming the beds and the pillows, thinking it was some kind of an allergic thing. But Tracy's family can't ignore an even more frightening condition that's beginning to emerge. She became very forgetful, and she'd forget things that we talked about a day before. She couldn't even find a way around her hometown. She wouldn't know which street to turn on, and it was the street we lived on. It gets so busy that I thought that my forgetfulness had to do with just a little bit of, again, anxiety and panic, or um, just having my thoughts in too many places. And I had to start writing things down. I was actually writing, don't forget to buy gas, and putting it on my dashboard right next to the gauges and because I would forget to fill my tank. And then the ultimate humiliation. I started to have uh, incontinence. I think she tried to hide from me as much as she could. I think she was embarrassed. She really didn't talk too much about it. It really culminated to, for me to be an emotional breakdown is that um, I was out picking my son up from sports, and I went back to my house, and we had company I saw when I pulled in the driveway, and I had, had to go so bad, and I didn't make it. She was embarrassed, so I had to go inside, and I had to get clothes for her, and she pulled her out of the back of the house and got changed. That first day, I had full-out incontinence, and, and it was in front of somebody. It was in front of my son. It was absolutely devastating. She usually stayed pretty tough when I was around, but a few times that she'd break down and start crying. That was one of those times. But frustratingly, Tracy's doctor doesn't seem to make a connection between these alarming new symptoms and offers little insight into what's going on. Whenever I went to see my family doctor, I would mention the different symptoms, and he tended to focus on one or two of them and just focus on giving me medications or diagnostic testing just for that. Take a pill, take this medication to help you cough. Uh, but she knew that that wasn't the answer. Yeah, I knew that she had problems, but it was a helpless feeling I had. I felt sometimes that I, I wished that I could take some of her pain. Then, while driving home from work one day, Tracy gets into a minor car accident. She escapes with only a few scrapes, but after the accident, her symptoms continue to intensify. I hurt my neck. And boy, did that flare a lot, a whole new world of pain. That was increasing the severity of my headaches. I did have an x-ray done, didn't show anything. So I tried to ignore it, but it kept getting worse. It was real bad. I think she was in bed two, three days out of the week. Just nauseous every morning. She missed a lot of work. She had to medicate daily to suppress the pain. No longer able to stand the pain. In November of 1999, Tracy makes an appointment with physiatrist Martin Bleiberg. Physiatrists specialize in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Tracy thinks that he might be able to find a link between her different conditions. The first thing I thought of was that she might have a disc problem in her neck. It is common that someone can be involved in a car accident and the disc can actually give out. And if that disc actually comes into contact with our spinal cord, we can get a lot of symptoms. Dr. Bleiberg immediately decides to perform an MRI on Tracy's neck. The Killarneys are hopeful that after five agonizing years, they'll finally have an answer to all of Tracy's problems. And sure enough, when the results come in, Dr. Bleiberg believes he has zeroed in on a crucial piece of the puzzle. The MRI revealed that she had a disc herniation between two bones in the neck. It would cause pain in the neck. It could explain numbness, tingling, and symptoms in the arm. Therefore, that was a likely cause of her symptoms. Dr. Bleiberg refers Tracy to a neurosurgeon who tells her that the herniated disc can be surgically removed. It looks like Tracy's pain will finally be going away for good. I thought, great, we found what's wrong, what your problems are, and we'll get it taken care of, and we'll live happily ever after was hoping that, you know, I get this disc out. It would probably get me back to the way I was two or three years ago. I was very, very desperate to stop the pains. Every surgery has a risk, especially in the neck. We worried about it.
Tracy Killarney has been living with debilitating pain for six years. But in 2000, one doctor finally seems to have figured out what's causing her myriad symptoms. Tracy has a herniated spinal disc and will need to undergo spinal fusion surgery to repair it. I was worried about it, but on the other hand, I was looking forward to the end result. Thankfully, the tricky operation is successful, and Tracy begins to feel something she hasn't experienced for some time, optimism. She was very hopeful about it. She thought that that would help. Symptoms did get better. I had a hard collar on for a couple of months, and having my neck in traction just it, it helped with the headaches, it helped with a lot of le the neurological symptoms. And I was starting to think, you know what? Life's really gonna take a change here. But when it comes time to take off the surgical collar a few months later, things rapidly go downhill. I was in tears the minute I took it off and tried to go a few hours with the, the weight of my head on my neck again. It was absolutely miserable. And I put my collar back on and said, I can't do it. It's just too painful. Then suddenly, all of her symptoms begin to return. The headaches, the dizziness, the incontinence. She had problems daily, uh, but she still functioned because she didn't so want to sound like a complainer. Tracy hopes that the healing process is just taking a little longer than expected and pushes through her pain the best she can. I don't think anybody's ever going to get rid of 100% of their medical problems. It, aches and pains are part of the aging process. We didn't shut our life down. We kept trying to do things and pressing the limits and seeing what I could do this week and what I couldn't and hope for the best. But a year after the surgery, Tracy is still dependent on the collar to get her through the day. Her excruciating headaches and dizzy spells have become so bad, they're incapacitating. Not only did all the symptoms come back, but they were getting worse. They were more intense, more frequent vomiting. They started having an increase in heart palpitations, but things started to really get out of control. My parents kind of tried to keep it away from me and not really let me know, so I didn't have to worry about it. I thought that maybe that her lifespan might not be very long if she continued down this downhill skid that she was in. We were just helpless uh, until somebody could find out what was really going on. In desperation, Tracy decides to return to Dr. Blyberg one last time. She said, if anybody can find my problem, Dr. Blyberg, because he's so thorough, he'll find out what's wrong with me. She was having some symptoms that were not typical after surgery, and at that point, I really started to wonder what was going on. Beginning to suspect that Tracy's problem may be far more complex than he originally thought, Dr. Blyberg decides to go back to square one and conducts a thorough head-to-toe -to -toe examination. He begins by testing Tracy's neurological function by doing what's known as a Hoffman test. You literally take the patient's hand and you actually flick the finger down. For a normal patient, the thumb doesn't move. But when we have a problem with the brain or with the spinal cord, the thumb actually starts to flick in. And Tracy had one of those, and that made me somewhat suspicious. Shockingly, this simple test seems to provide an insight that more sophisticated tests have missed, a problem with Tracy's spinal cord. Dr. Blyberg immediately orders another MRI, but this one is different. I ordered it with contrast. Contrast is a material that actually gets injected, and that will actually help the radiologist see things better. After I had that MRI done with contrast, I was pretty blasé about the answers. I really expected them to call me up and say, yeah, it was normal. But instead, the MRI with contrast reveals a terrifying image. The testing eventually revealed that she had a tumor that appeared to be coming off cranial nerve 9. Tracy had a schwannoma. A schwannoma is a non-cancerous tumor located on the tissue that wraps around the 12 cranial nerves at the base of the brain. The tissue, made of schwann cells, helps support and protect the nerves. As the schwannoma develops, it presses against the 12 nerves, which control vital organ function. If those tumors become large enough, it eventually crowds out the brainstem, and a person can stop breathing and actually die. I had spent a lot of years looking for answers, and sometimes you don't want to hear the answer. And that was a bad day for me. It was a very, very surreal moment. It was very scary. I knew what a tumor was and how, how significant it was. It could have been the end of her life. 
Even worse, the MRI shows that the schwannoma has spread from its original location on nerve 9 to affect her 10th and 11th nerves as well. The ninth cranial nerve serves the, the vocal cords, the left side of my throat, and must be where that cough was coming from. The pressure on the 10th and the 11th nerve apparently was where the incontinence could have been coming from. The 10th and 11th cranial nerves can actually affect your heart function. Um, that was one of the biggest concerns. So we can get things like neck pain, jaw pain, ear fullness. We get hearing deficits. We get problems with balance. And the bad news keeps coming. The tumor has grown so large, Dr. Bleiberg believes Tracy's only chance to survive is an extremely risky and delicate surgery. As we go in to remove the tumor, the neurosurgeon is working in a very small, delicate area. One slip of the scalpel, the patient can die. But Tracy decides that the dangerous surgery is her only option. After doing extensive research, she finds a neurosurgeon in North Carolina who she believes is the best doctor to remove the tumor. The family immediately packs up and heads south. We were really scared. When they find a, a tumor like that, we were worried we, that she might not be around you know, forever, and Sean and I might have to go on with our lives, just me and him, or her possibly on a vent. I knew the risks, and they knew how bad it could be. I was pretty sure I was going to die. On January 11, 2001, terrified that she might not make it through surgery, Tracy writes out her will and says goodbye to her loved ones. Then she's wheeled into the OR for what will be a long and laborious surgery. They started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they didn't get to the tumor until this is like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. To access the tumor, the neurosurgeon makes an incision behind Tracy's ear and removes a small piece of her skull. It's a tense time. He has to work his way along the cranial nerves, taking out the huge tumor as he goes. Meanwhile, Tracy's family is outside, waiting. It was very quiet. Everybody was kind of lost in their own thoughts. Look forward to solve these problems one way or the other and uh, relieve her from her pain. Finally, after 14 hours, the procedure is over. It's a success. Tracy is wheeled into a recovery room and slowly begins to regain consciousness. First thing I remember coming out of surgery, besides the joy that I was alive, was that um, I could breathe on my own. The skilled neurosurgeon has been able to remove the entire tumor without causing any injury to the delicate spinal cord. Tracy's surgery actually went remarkably well. After a few weeks, Tracy returns home to begin the long, arduous recovery process. But she soon realizes something major has changed. My symptoms were gone. It was absolutely, it, it was just a miracle to me that all of those things were all coming from one problem and they're, they're all gone. Tracy is thrilled. She realizes she's tremendously lucky the schwannoma was found at all. Cranial nerve schwannomas are extremely rare and difficult to spot because, ironically, the symptoms they cause are fairly mundane. Her symptoms appeared more run-of-the-mill, so to speak. Sometimes we don't look for the zebra in a field of horses, and so that delays diagnosis. But if the patient is persistent and the doctor is persistent, eventually we do find the zebras. Today, six years after the surgery, the Killarney's life has changed completely. The nightmare of excruciating pain and uncontrollable symptoms is finally over. Tracy's prognosis at this point is excellent. She has had no evidence at all of any type of recurrence of this tumor, nor is any expected, and she should be able to lead a nice, full, normal life. She's doing excellent. She's a great mom, great wife. I'm happy to have her here. I think that changed her to make her have a different outlook on life. She feels blessed to be alive still. I realize what's important in life, and it's really easy for me to look at the little things in life and brush off what's not important and focus on what is.